Hi all, let's look at another fascinating game from the recent TSAC Season 15 Super Final. So Leela was playing White against Stockfish, and we have the same opening as the previous game we saw between the two in the King's Engine defense. So Leela taking the white side of the Simish variation. So let's have a look. So the Simish variation F3 after Friedrich Simish. Uh, so Bishop E3, E5, this is the end of the book. Leela plays d5. We have c6. Queen d2, c takes, c takes, knight a6. So white has a space advantage. And uh, g4 was played here. Uh, the choice of Anatoly Karpov against Topolov in this position in Varna 1995 was actually knight g e2. And that game eventually ended in a draw. Uh, at move 54. So g4, slightly unusual. Knight c5, and we're really out of stem games already. Uh, bishop d7 is the highest stem game I found here after this g4 move. And after bishop d3, there was a win for white, as in Pernig against Knoll in Austria 2007. So an interesting game from that position. So here we see knight c5. So we're in kind of new territory already at move 11 h4, h5, and kind of outrageously, Leela just closes the king side, g5. You might think this is somewhat counterintuitive, as surely you want to open lines against the opponent's king. Uh, why would you possibly want to do this? Well, it depends really where your king is. One factor is if you castle on the queen side, it kind of locks up the king side, and you might actually want to play on the queen side without worrying of the king side uh, in a way so and that's that seems to be what happens here because this knight is also kickable with b4 which could be the start of a space gaining uh, campaign on the queen side uh, so b4 it is actually kicked and now with this bishop temporarily not looking at h3 well it wasn't a problem to play this anyway but knight h3 is pretty comfortable to play uh, very interesting knight movements uh, very interesting later as well, as as I'll mention. Uh, A5 was played, and we have B5, and we see an underlying lockdown on the C6 square here already with this pawn chain. It's a fascinating pawn chain aesthetically. Uh, knight C5, Knight F2, King H7, Bishop E2, we see B6. This does weaken that C6 square. And at the moment, it doesn't seem as though this is that exploitable, surely. Uh, how would you actually get to c6 how would you do anything with that there's a fantastic blockade on c5 right uh shielding the c6 square we see knight d3 f5 now if knight takes d3 this does mean that b6 is kind of raw for example like this knight a4 would be a key move and then uh with uh, b5 just reinforced White could actually consider knight takes b6, this tactic to celebrate uh, things on the queen side. And this is actually very advantageous for white, uh, this kind of scenario. Hugely advantageous for white. So it gets very dangerous on knight takes d3. So this knight really is acting as a shield for black's queen side position, especially b6, right now. f5. Leela doesn't want to open up, you know, semi open g5. I'm not interested, just interested in the queen side. We see rook f1, rook f7, and you might wonder, what if uh, black here took on e4, does it matter? White just ends up with a comfortable position, for example, like this. It's uh, The knight's controlling key squares. It's just very comfortable. This bishop, you see, is hemmed in here in its own pawn chain. It's not that pleasant for black. Uh, so um, we see, actually, rook f7, white castles queenside, rook b7, king b1, bishop d7, now knight b2, rook c7, and in fact now bishop takes c5. Now quite often in Leela games, when she gives up a bishop with a certain colour, it's quite often the other colour complex, when I say complex, the set of squares on the other colour, which are kind of hammered later. We've seen that over and over again in a lot of Leela games. So is it something to do with these light squares in black's camp? We see rook takes c5. On b takes c5, uh, this means this is a you know potential passed pawn. Uh, but 
by white reinforcing b5 first, actually a5 is also potentially under scrutiny. So for example, uh, this kind of situation, you can see a5 under scrutiny, and white could build up the pressure here. And here's just an example where, in fact, uh, white could eventually play for b6 with a big advantage. So b takes doesn't seem to have too much uh, going for it. d takes even worse. If, if taking this way, then there's the immediate d6 and queen d5. And in fact, here, there's bishop c4. And you can see that g8 with these uh, disconnected pieces from the back rank, the knight is having a lot of trouble here. This this cramping g5 is stopping knight, even knight f6. So black could end up just having to lose the knight to defend g8. So that's kind of an amusing variation. <laughs> oh, otherwise, let's put that on the board for fun. Uh, you know, queen g8, checkmate. So uh, one for the puzzle book there. Rook takes c5 was played. Uh, and we have now rook c1, f4. So black's closing up the position. And I usually say uh, when someone closes the position, it's like you've got a free hand on the other side. Um, I don't usually say a free hand in order to create a, a secret piano concerto. We'll, concerto, concerto. We'll get to that later. But it's almost as if these knights now, uh, there's, there's a very interesting set of knight movements I've noticed for this game, which I haven't really noticed in many chess games. You know, it never occurred to me to check out the kind of musical notation of a chess game before. But uh, this will become apparent shortly. Rook fd1, bishop f8, rook, uh, sorry, bishop f1, rook a7, queen c2, rook b7, queen b3, bishop e7. Uh, look at the knight movements. So uh, I, I started to note they're, they're a bit peculiar. Uh, this is at move 29. Uh, rook takes... Rook takes. Okay, so the knight's putting pressure on b6, knight c7, and there's a really, you know, from a chess point of view, a really, you know, fascinating move that c6 is plunged into here. It can't really be uh, taken. Knight a8 is played. That doesn't seem like the greatest square for a chess knight in in history. But uh, if bishop takes c6, d takes. Uh, white gets an overwhelming position, can enter in on f7 and start taking pawns, and that's going to be crushing. This is just absolutely hopeless for black, this kind of scenario. Uh, so that's a very, very bad idea to let the queen in, you know, with tempo on the rook, queen into f7. So it can't really be taken. And, it, and it's actually in numerous places it's offered, and it just it just can't really be taken. So the knights now play like this. And I started recording... Uh, in particular, at move 33, I, I fought the two knights. You see they're, they're at c4 and c3 here. I started. I made a few notes about where the knights kind of end up. I thought this was absolutely fascinating. Bishop e8. If knight c7, then that drops the b6. So the knight on a8 is, is on a defensive duty for b6. Because uh, this kind of thing, uh, white just plays bishop takes b5 and and ends up material up, bishop takes d7. So the knight has to remain on just protecting b6. So bishop e8, bishop h3, white's taking even more territory on the knight squares now after this. Uh, rook b8, say bishop d7, just to show that the helplessness of the black position, then knight takes d6, an interruption of d6, and here they hits the, the rook. So there's no bishop d7, on bishop takes c6 here, you might want to revisit this possibility. White just, in fact, plays even a4, has time to even play a4. It's just hugely dominant on the light squares, this position with that light square bishop, not going anywhere here. And white just, just builds up like this, for example, and concretely will be starting to win material like this, for example. So it doesn't bear thinking about. Black is dead in this position, totally dead without any counterplay whatsoever. So rook b8, queen d1, knight c7 was played. Here, just for interest's sake, bishop takes again. Uh, you can see after a4, key move, uh, white's domination on the light squares. Uh, Anatoly Karpov would be proud, perhaps, of this. Uh, it's just complete domination, and white can end up winning material, and then it's all over, basically. So uh, knight c7, a4, Bishop f8. Uh, again, okay, just 
check this out again if you don't believe the light square domination even here if d6 drops that's going to be it there's there's these big pawns to be pushed devastation so bishop f8 queen d3 and we have knight b2 rook c4 and it looked here what when when observing this game in real time uh people were starting to wonder what is going on here with these knights uh so knight e2 and i started to feel a bit um awkward i didn't really i uh, couldn't really see what to say about these knights uh they're just going to different configurations but the the rook's now plunging into c8 knight c7 uh you might think well why why was that allowed uh well basically um okay let's let's just run with it uh, knight c7 on bishop d7 white could take on d7 and just take that knight so you know black's got very limited replies here that knight being hit knight c7 queen c2 bishop f8 knight b3 king g8 queen c4 king g7 and this is just where i f i just thought this was extremely odd especially during the live stream of the game uh, so at move 48 uh, we have knight d3 uh, and now the knight the knight just seems to be uh, playing around so i'm wondering i'm, I'm starting to wonder uh, well after after checking this game out um, wh what does this actually represent uh, in, in a musical context these knights uh, they're going around and round i was wondering this is this is quite fascinating I've recently seen uh, Close Encounters, and uh, if you've seen that film, there's a bit of uh, music in there, uh, a, f a famous, iconic uh, bit of music. So so here, King, uh, sorry, Knight B3, King G8, and that, that pawn drops. You might have wondered, did Black really have to give up the pawn? Well, actually, there was a key moment around here where if Rook A7 wasn't played, uh, if if say King G8 was played instead, not giving Rook B8. Sorry about this rewind. There was actually uh, in this position Queen C6 because that bishop's pinned, so that hits the Rook and hits E8. And if here, then Queen takes B6 anyway. Uh, also the, in this position before Rook A7 was played, it, it is a kind of a zugzwang. So on Bishop F8, then there's Knight takes A5 and B6. Uh, this is devastation. Uh, for example, rook takes rook takes c c7 is is pinning the queen to the king. And on move 60, if bishop h8 had been played again, knight takes a5 and then b6. And again, we we have this situation where it's it's kind of destructive. Rook takes e8 is a nice little tactic for queen c7 check, picking up that rook. So there's a lot of destruction and carnage uh, in the position before you know rook a7 which seems to give up the you know the b8 square which seems to give up b6 so whilst leela is playing around with her knights it seems stockfish is going into a self-destruct mode here just giving up pawns so everyone's wondering wow uh, stockfish is really put off with the knights dancing around starting to give up pawns to, to spare the uh the knight piano concerto here or something uh so knight d2 uh knight b3 rook takes b6 finally uh, there is also it's possible to play knight takes a5 if rook takes a5 uh, rook b7 and you can see that's really quite a nasty situation uh, and here if b takes then b b6 is pretty crushing uh, taking here taking there uh, it, it's all pretty crushing basically uh, on rook a8 then b takes c7 Crush, crushing uh, again hold on so um so here we have actually rook takes b6 queen d8 rook c6 knight a8 yes it's pretty miserable we can revisit this bishop takes c6 here just for interest it's pretty destru destructive with a b6 and here you know just it's carnage again it's absolute carnage so uh knight a8 uh we have rook c8 queen b6 rook takes e8 rook c7 queen e2 queen a7 and the game ended here if it continued uh well why is of course a piece up yes one two three four i should have pointed that out earlier yeah white's a piece up the game ended here um so rook c8 for example would would simplify and just 
you know, you just need to like, get the queens off going to C6. So, yeah, the desperate point where black, you know, ended up losing a piece after losing that key pawn, you know, around here, uh, giving a piece, the whole position is just collapsing. So it's a fascinating game. And as I say, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a very special addendum. I haven't done this ever for a chess game before. Just to, just to try and hear what this sounds. So um, I'm going to get my... Uh, brother, I call Nick Pod by the way because he calls me Tripod. We call each other Pod for short. I'm going to get Nick Pod on the case on this particular game just for the record to see this secret piano concerto, not concerto, concerto. So bear with me for an interesting addendum. You see, I do like to give you a bit of variety with these chess videos. Okay, so back soon. Hope you enjoyed this so far. And for a second, more normal addendum. <laughs> this is what happens when you watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You get carried away. So anyway, normal addendum. Let's have a look at the puzzles from this game. So white's play here. Yeah, this was a variation where we could mate on G8. So I'm mating one there. Let's just do a few of these, five of these. White's play for a clear advantage here. I think we can snap off B6 here quite safely. And take on D7, ending up. Material up. Uh, white play for a clear edge here. I think we could take on d6 there. Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Taking on d6 and then we can take on b7. White play here. I think c7 looks pretty crushing. And just one more. Uh, black to play here for a clear advantage. If b5 is neglected, I think it could be taken here, actually, and then white could be smashed up if Lila really badly uh, misplayed it. I'm not sure what to play here. What was the hint? Uh, Queen c7, okay. Okay, yeah, check that out if you want to review the variations of this game. Okay, thanks very much.